Welcome back everyone, Houston Math Prep here. In this video, we're gonna introduce quadric surfaces, also sometimes called quadratic surfaces, because these are surfaces in 3D space that are represented by quadratic equations. We'll be taking a look at these quadric surfaces and in a way thinking of them as a 3D expansion of the conic sections from 2D space. So when you're beginning your work with quadric surfaces in three dimensions, we recommend being solid on your conic sections in particular circles, ellipses, parabolas, and hyperbolas, as we'll be seeing these 2D shapes a lot when we break these 3D surfaces down. Here's just the big fancy equation that we call the general form for a quadric surface. And this is just saying that if your equation fits the format where all of its terms are listed here, then we consider it a quadric surface. When you first encounter quadric surfaces, it's likely that you'll see these terms we've highlighted here most commonly. So you're likely to see some quadratic terms, possibly some linear terms of x, y, and z as well, and of course also a constant perhaps. These combo x, y, y, z, and x, z terms you might come across occasionally, perhaps a little less common to see these, especially when first starting out and getting the hang of basic quadric surfaces. You might notice that if we only had the first three quadratic terms with a constant, that could possibly give us an equation for a sphere. Also, if we only have the dx, ey, or fz terms in our equation, that would actually give us the equation for a plane. So we can technically consider planes and spheres to be quadric surfaces, but since we've already done videos on planes and spheres in our Calculus 3 video series before this, we're going to focus on the quadric surfaces that aren't planes and spheres in this video. The first quadric surface we'll look at is the ellipsoid. We'll see real quick here why it's named this. Notice for an ellipsoid, all of the quadratic terms are there, and they're all positive when set equal to 1. These constants and the denominators here in the formula tell us about the dimensions of the ellipsoid. We'll take a particular example here and break it down for you a bit. So we've got x squared plus y squared over 4 plus z squared over 9 is equal to 1. We're going to be using traces actually in the coordinate planes to build the shapes of our quadric surfaces in this video. Remember that a coordinate plane trace can be found by setting the other variable not named in the trace equal to zero. So if we first look at the xy trace, that will be the intersection of the ellipsoid with the xy plane, and we can find that by setting z equal to zero. Doing this zeroes out the z term and leaves us with this equation that only involves x and y. And if we know our 2D conics well, then we should be able to say that this would be an ellipse in the xy plane. The dimensions of this ellipse are based on the values for a and b in the formula. Here you can see a would be 1 and b is equal to 2 since 4 is b squared. So we have an ellipse centered at the origin that goes out one unit in the x direction on either side of the origin and two units in the y direction on either side of the origin. If we go back to our ellipsoid equation and now think about looking at the yz trace, the yz trace would be when x equals 0. So we have these terms left plugging in 0 for x, and we again get an ellipse in the yz plane, this time going out 2 units in the y direction and 3 units in the z direction from its center at the origin, based on our values for b and c here. We have one more coordinate plane trace left to look at before having them all, and that will be our xz trace. For the xz trace, we set y equals 0, and that leaves us with quadratic x and z terms only. This equation in the xz plane will also give us an ellipse that goes out one unit in the x direction and three in the z direction based on a and c. If we now look at all of the coordinate plane traces together, and for the ellipsoid here, you can see all of the traces are ellipses, so there's a really good reason to call this an ellipsoid, right? We start to get an idea of what this looks like, and if I graph the ellipsoid surface here, and then I remove my traces, we can clearly see our ellipsoid looking something like the shape of a piece of candy or a tablet of medicine or something similar. If we alter the constants in the equation, so here now you notice that my values for b and c are the same, so this looks more like what we might think of as maybe the shape of an M&M candy, where it's not completely spherical like a ball, but it certainly looks round from a certain direction. If we actually have the case where all of our constants a, b, and c in this equation are equal, then our ellipsoid does actually take on the form of a sphere. We can see why this is if we then multiply the entire equation by the common denominator, we get an equation for a sphere as we're used to seeing it. 
Next we'll look at cones as a quadric surface. you notice that the equation form of a cone looks a bit different than the ellipsoid. We've got two quadratic terms on one side with the third quadratic term on the other side. You'll also notice that all the terms are the same sign here. It's possible that the cone is a circular cone as we usually think of a typical one. Or it's possible that it has an elliptical shape to it instead, and that depends on the two constants that are on the same side of the equation here. In this case, the ones we are calling a and b. We're going to go ahead and break down a cone for you that isn't circular. So you'll see we've got different values for constants a and b here. We've got x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 is equal to z squared over 16. Starting with the xy trace, we'll need to set the other variable z equal to zero. Doing this gives us an equation where we're adding two squares together to get zero. Since squares can never be negative, the only way for this to be true is when x and y are both zero. And in the xy plane, that would be true only at the origin. So our trace in the xy plane is just a single point, the origin. Looking back at our original equation to find the yz trace, we'll set x equal to zero, which gives us the y squared and the z squared terms equal to each other. And if we solve for z, we'll get plus minus a linear equation, which gives us a yz trace of lines that intersect at the origin. We get a similar thing when finding the xz trace, setting y equal to zero, gives us the x squared and z squared terms equal. And solving for z again will give us linear equations with plus minus cases, so we again get two lines that intersect the origin. And if we look at all the coordinate traces at once, and we imagine the surface defined by these, you can see we get a cone, or actually a double cone. And in this case, you can tell by looking maybe at the upper half here that the cone has an elliptical shape to it. If we change our equation so that the values for a and b on the left side are equal, then you can see that we get a round shape to the cone. That gives us a circular cone instead of an elliptical one. If we want our cones to open in a different direction entirely, then we can change which quadratic term is alone on the right side. And here you can see that the quadratic term on the opposite side of the equation from the other two tells us the axis of symmetry for the cone. So in this case now, the y-axis is our axis of symmetry, or we can say that the cones open in the y-directions. Another quadric surface, the paraboloid, has a name that probably gives you a hint about its shape. Here the form is a little different because we've only got two of the variables in quadratic terms and the other is in a linear term, with the linear term by itself on one side and the quadratic terms having the same sign on the other side. Just like with cones, if the constants a and b are the same, our paraboloid will be circular, and if they're not equal, then our paraboloid will be elliptical. Here we'll look through an example of a circular paraboloid. You can see that a squared and b squared are both 4 here in our example. If we try to figure out the xy trace by setting the other variable z equal to 0, we get something similar to the cone. We have two quadratic terms adding to get 0. Since this can only happen when x and y are both 0, we get that the trace of our paraboloid in the xy plane is just a point, just the origin. Setting x equal to 0 for the yz trace gives us an equation in terms of y and z. It would be a parabola in the yz plane. And setting y equal to 0 for our xz trace gives us another parabola equation in terms of x and z. Looking at all of the traces together, we can start to see the structure for this surface that's based on parabolas. Graphing our surface, this paraboloid in particular, as we said, is a circular paraboloid that opens upward from the origin in 3D space. With our paraboloid, if we adjust so that there's a different linear variable with two quadratic terms on the other side still having the same sign, then that linear variable, in this case x we've drawn here, tells us the axis of symmetry, and the paraboloid opens in the direction of that axis, so here the x-axis in this case. One final example here of a paraboloid, as with many of these surfaces, the addition of a constant can also shift the central point of the surface away from the origin, like you see here. And with the paraboloid, if both quadratic terms are negative, we said they need to be the same sign, those quadratic terms, then the paraboloid will open in the negative direction of the axis of symmetry. Next up, our quadric surface, the hyperbolic paraboloid. The name of this one kind of leads us in two different directions as to what to expect. 
Notice that this equation looks really similar to the equation for the paraboloid, with the difference being that this equation has two quadratic terms on the same side that are of opposite sign. We do still have a linear variable by itself on one side though. The example we'll show here is just a basic z equals x squared minus y squared. And we'll begin just like before, finding the xy trace means setting z equal to zero. If you imagine moving the y term to the other side, then after this we'd end up with a solution of y equals plus or minus x. So this gives us a trace in the xy plane of two intersecting lines through the origin. Our yz trace will be when we set x equal to zero. In our example here, since the y squared term is negative, we'll get a parabola as the trace in the yz plane, but it'll open downward from the origin in that plane. For the xz trace, however, making y equal zero gives us another parabola equation in terms of x and z, only this time the trace opens in the positive direction from the origin. So if we look at all of the traces together for this one, the bones of this surface really maybe don't give quite as clear of a picture as some of the others. The lines give us some idea of flatness in the diagonal directions, while the surface looks like it's opening up in some directions and down in some other directions. If we actually graph the hyperbolic paraboloid itself, you can see how traveling in the y direction, the origin is at the top of a hill, while traveling on the surface in the x direction, the origin is the low point in a valley on this object. If we go ahead and change the variables around in our equation, so if we change our equation around so that the y term is positive and the x term is negative, it might be easier to see that this is really the shape of a saddle here, with the front and back of the saddle extending upward from the origin, and the sides of the saddle traveling downward. With the linear variable z here, you can think of this as the direction your head would point when riding on the saddle. You might also recognize this shape as the shape of Pringle's potato chips. The remaining two quadric surfaces to cover here in our video have similar names, depending on whether we're talking about one connected surface or two separate surfaces. So the first, a hyperboloid of one sheet, has an equation that looks similar to an ellipsoid, except that one of the quadratic terms is negative. This negative term actually tells the axis of symmetry for this one sheet hyperboloid, which we'll see here shortly. Our example we're going to show is simply x squared plus y squared minus z squared equal to 1. So if we set z equals 0 to find our xy trace, that will give us x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. In this case, that's a circle for the xy trace. Now our example here had all of a, b, and c equal to 1. So if you have an equation where those are not the same, this would actually be an ellipse, not a perfect circle. But in our example here, it's a circle. For the yz trace, setting x equal to 0, we get quadratic terms with opposite signs. That indicates a hyperbola for us. And a similar thing happens in determining our xz trace here. With making y equal 0, we get a hyperbola in terms of x and z this time. All of our traces combined gives us a fairly clear picture of how a one-sheet hyperboloid will look. We get a nice wormhole-looking type of object from science fiction, maybe. It has a nice hourglass shape to it. And here you can see what we mentioned before, that since the quadratic z term is negative, this is the axis of symmetry for the hyperboloid that runs through the center of it. If we change the constants in our equation, obviously we can adjust the dimensions of the hyperboloid. With a wider center here, these surfaces resemble the shape of cooling towers for nuclear power plants. And if we change which term is negative on the left side, then you can see the axis of symmetry occurs in the direction of this variable. So here the y term is negative, and so the y-axis runs through the center of our hyperboloid. So now keep in mind, this is a hyperboloid of one sheet. We also have a hyperboloid of two sheets, so you can see that it really does make a difference if we give a sheet. A two-sheet hyperboloid is actually two separate surfaces that are defined by this one equation here. Notice that this equation looks like the ellipse equation, but it has two terms that are negative. So in the one-sheet hyperboloid equation, we have one negative term. For the two-sheet hyperboloid, we have two negative terms. In this case, the positive term indicates the axis of symmetry. For both of the hyperboloid equations, the quadratic term that is the opposite sign from the others determines the direction of symmetry. That's a nice way to keep it straight in your mind, maybe.
For our last example here, we've got z squared minus x squared minus y squared is equal to 1. And it turns out that if we solve for the xy trace by setting z equal to 0, since both quadratic terms on the left side are negative, it's actually impossible for the left side to equal positive 1. So we get no xy trace at all for this two-sheet hyperboloid. If we set x equal to 0 to find the y trace, then we get z squared minus y squared equals 1, which is a hyperbola in the yz plane. When we use y equals 0 for the xz trace, you can see we also get a hyperbola, this time in terms of x and z. So you'll notice that our hyperboloid of two sheets in this example doesn't touch the xy plane, and the two traces we do have give an idea of the shape of these two separate pieces of the surface. So we see why this surface is considered to have two sheets versus the one sheet hyperboloid. For this surface, changing which quadratic term on the left side is positive will give us a different axis of symmetry. So you can see when we make the y squared term positive, for example, this axis of symmetry actually is the only axis that intersects both pieces of the surface. All right, everyone, that's the Grand Quadric Surface Tour. Before you check out our next video, be sure to grab some hyperbolic paraboloids to snack on. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.